Good evening, everybody. I'm sure we'll have more folks join us. Welcome to the high schoolers. So glad that we have a, more guys in here tonight. Remember how last week I said every week I find a new way to mess up the live stream? I didn't mess it up at all last week. It worked really well. But this week I messed it up so royally it's not even live streaming at all now. So, you know, I, I, I doubled up from last week. So I found a way to, to completely end the live stream so I'm having to record it. So if you're watching, I apologize that we didn't live stream it. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's go ahead and start with the prayer. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for our time together. We thank you, Father, for Jesus and for his example for us. May we keep our eyes on Jesus tonight as we study, but every moment of every day of our lives. Father, we pray these things in his name. Amen. Okay, as we wait for everybody to get here, let's, uh, let's talk about what this means. First of all, what is masculinity? What do we mean when we say masculinity? While you're thinking of your answer for that, um, I was getting ready and someone came in the room. She didn't know how many times I've messed up things having to do with technology. And she said, I need some masculinity in the other room. And I was like, well, that's interesting given our topic. I was like, I wonder exactly what she's going to mean. She needed the password for a computer. And I said, you know I'm going to use this as an example, right? That that's, that's your version of masculinity. So apparently for some people, uh, masculinity is being able to operate technology. I don't know. <laughs> what else? What, what is masculinity? What do we mean when we say masculinity? Male qualities. Okay, male qualities. Yes, male qualities. That's good. Yeah. What does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be um, a male? Yeah, for sure. Outside of... The obvious, right? Outside of biology, uh, what, what does it mean to, to be a man? And, and specifically, we even use phrases like real man, right? Like, what, what does it mean to be a real man? We even joke about things like a man card. And if you do the wrong thing, that you get your man card removed or you get your man card. Uh, other cultures, we talked in the first week about how in other cultures they have uh, moments and ceremonies and rituals where they cross over into manhood. Um, and so what all is wrapped up in that? What does it mean to be masculine? And so we in this class are saying what it means to be masculine is to be cruciform. And cruciform means what? Okay, the image of the cross, right? Shaped like the cross. So we're saying a masculinity that is shaped like the cross, a masculinity that is shaped like what Jesus did. No worries, no worries. Maybe it'll come back on. Where's Zach? Where's Zach? Was he in here? Oh. There's a, there's a cord back there? If, I'll walk back there and... Oh, Richard... There's, a, there's an HDMI cord that is on the bottom. You may just wiggle the, the HDMI cord and see if it, it may have just gotten bumped. So you guys are demonstrating your, your masculinity according to some people's standard of masculinity. There's, there's another HDMI cord on the shelf underneath that, guys. If you want to swap that one out and see if that works, I don't know. Thank you. Look at that. Look at our shepherds jumping in there and serving. Okay. Um, Okay, so what we're saying in this class is that as Christians, our definition of masculinity should be shaped by the cross. In other words, it should be shaped by what Jesus did at the cross. Every time the New Testament tells us to follow the example of Jesus, do what Jesus did, what's it talking about? Specifically, what's it talking about? Not wear sandals or wear a robe or, um, you know, speak... Aramaic or, you know, practice ancient Judaism. What, what is it telling us to do? Thank you, guys. Good job. Um, ah, there we go. It is what it is. It was not working uh, 20 minutes ago, too, so it's okay. It's not y'all's fault. Um, so so what, what does the New Testament, what is the New Testament telling us to do when it tells us to follow the example of Jesus? What? Okay, that's an interesting idea. Treat people like Jesus and, and, um, and, and teach like Jesus. Specifically, there's one thing that Jesus did, and it does have to do with how he treated people, but specifically, I guess there may be two. Two, one right before this, and then one right after. Okay, serve, yes, but specifically how? What's the example? What's the example? 
Okay, that's the that's one. Jesus said, go, he's, he's the one that said that one. He said, go and do likewise, right? But then every time the apostles say, follow the example of Jesus, it's specifically the cross. Every time. When, they, when the apostles tell people, follow the example of Jesus, do what he did, it's always pointing back to the cross. There's about three there. Bet you can make somebody move if you need them to, guys. Um, so every time the New Testament tells us to follow the example of Jesus, it's always pointing back to the cross. That that is what, what we are supposed to follow and live out in everything that we do. Jesus said, this is the example I'm giving to you. John says in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 16 that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Uh, Paul, Philippians chapter 2, we'll read this in just a moment, you know, have this mind amongst yourselves, and it's talking about the incarnation and the crucifixion. What Jesus did in coming not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So the cross, specifically the cross, that's not to say that we shouldn't teach like Jesus taught or, or uh, treat people like Jesus did, not that we shouldn't follow the example of his life, but specifically the one specific example that we have other than washing feet is the idea of him laying down his life for other people. So that's why we say that if we're going to determine what does it mean to be a real Christian man, then the cross is where we look. If we're going to determine what does it mean to be a man like Jesus, then we look to the cross and ask, what does a crucified king teach us about being a man? Okay, you can't see this on the screen, but what does it mean to be ambitious? Let's talk about that tonight. What does it mean to be ambitious? What's that? Okay, yeah, I like that. Want something better for yourself. Want better for yourself. Okay, what else? What else does it mean to be ambitious? Motivated. Oh, good word. Yeah, motivated. Chasing after a goal. Chasing after a goal. Absolutely. Chasing after a goal. And it can be, it can be sort of that ambiguous, right? That, that generic. Chasing after a goal. And any kind of goal chasing could be a form of ambition, right? And so, yeah, chasing after any sort of a goal. And to be motivated towards that goal. And, and the, the goal is obviously something better than we currently have. Look at Carter. He's just going to Sit there and hold that and keep it, keep it in line for us. Okay, uh, how about this one? What are some typical American male ambitions? Okay, let's just be stereotypical here. But what are some typical American male ambitions? Good career. Okay, a career. Yeah, a good career. Make money. What's that? Make money. Make money. Have a family. Have a family. Have a family. Women. What's that? Women, yeah. What's that? Be a star, yeah, a star, absolutely, yeah. I'm sorry? Be famous. Be famous, yeah. Do well in whatever you're doing. It's hobbies like be a sailing, golf, sports. Absolutely. Whatever. Yeah, be, be great at whatever it is. Be, and, and sometimes not just great, but the best, the best right? <laughs> yeah, we want to be the best. We want to not just be, be good or be, and, and, and even how, how do we determine what's great? It's typically... Comparative, right? Typically comparative. Anything else? Muscles. Muscles, yeah, absolutely. What, what we look like, maybe whether or not we can lift something, but uh, more, more importantly, what we look like. Uh, what else? Anything else? Anything else? What's that? Intelligent. Intelligent, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so let me ask you this. What is the difference between being ambitious and being competitive? Similar ideas, right? For sure. Could you be ambitious without being competitive? Could you be competitive without being ambitious? What's the difference? Where do they overlap? Ambitious can be more self-focused, whereas competitive usually is targeted against some other measure outside yourself. Absolutely. So a lot of times there is overlap, right? But to go back to what Richard said, you could theoretically seek to be great at something without any sort of comparative. Now, typically, we're trying to compare ourselves, and we don't just want to be great, we want to be the best. And that's when it gets over sort of into competitiveness. But it could be, like John said, just a matter of with yourself, right? Just being ambitious within yourself. You're chasing after some goal. Whatever your goal is, you're pursuing it. It may or may not have to do with what someone else is doing. But then when we kind of look over at what somebody else is doing and we say, I don't just want to outrun the bear. I want to outrun you. You know, we want, we want to outrun the other guy. You know, we want to be better than they are. 
Um, we want to not just have enough money, we want to have m more money than they have. We don't want just a nice house, we want a better house than they have. We don't want just a nice car, we want a better car than them. We don't want just muscles, we want more muscles than them. We don't want, want to just be smart or intelligent, we want to be more intelligent than the people around us, right? So competitive is about comparison, trying to be better than other people. So it, it's still goal oriented, but the goal specifically is beating someone else. It's triumphing over someone else, right? Uh, but yeah, definitely a lot of, lot of overlap between those ideas. Could you be, are there some, what are some competitive environments that we just sort of find ourselves in? And even if we, even if we said, I don't really want to be a competitive person, or I'm not a competitive person, or I, I don't try to be competitive. Carter, you, you, are, you are a good man back there. You don't really, you really don't have to do that, I promise. <laughs> You're good. He's like, Moses, somebody go prop his arms up. Um, so so what, what kind of competitive environments exist? The workplace, okay, workplace is a competitive environment a lot of times, what else? Sports, yeah, sports, I mean, that, that is what sports are, right? Sports are by nature competitive, yeah. School, School yeah, absolutely, school is, is competitive. Siblings. Siblings, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I've got two boys myself, so, um, and they found out I was teaching tonight and that the teenagers were gonna be in here and they found somewhere else to be, so. Um, <laughs> So, 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 yeah, siblings can be competitive. What else? Politics. Politics, absolutely, absolutely. The freeway. The freeway, absolutely. <laughs> yes. yes, my son is learning how to drive, and, and I hear a lot keeping up with the flow of traffic. But that's, uh, that's kind of debatable sometimes, right? And it's probably debatable when we use that phrase, too. Okay, so is it possible to, is it possible to, good job, Zach, look at you. Um, Carter and Zach, way to go, guys. Um, is it possible to be in a competitive environment and still be ambitious without really being competitive? Yes. I, I just want to kind of throw that one out there to just kind of think sometimes about it. Sometimes other people are competitive with you. Okay, yeah. That's the way I find it. It's yeah. stressful sometimes yeah. because you, you're, you're either, you're going to be doing equally as well as everybody else and, or you're not. And then when performance times comes, if you're not, so it's competitive in a, for a different perspective. Mm, yeah, yeah, interesting, yeah. And, and that's, that's very difficult, isn't it? Because so many of, our, so many of our, our sort of structures around us, whether it's school or it's work or it's, it's family or it's politics, so much of what's around us is competitive. We, we just kind of, it's in the air that we breathe. And so this desire to, not just to do well, or even to do good, but to do better than someone else, to outdo them, to outperform them, to be superior to them. Now, we could debate all night. I, I read like a 30-page paper this week on the theology of competition. It was really interesting. Um, I won't necessarily recommend it because it was super boring also, but, um, <laughs> but le, le, we could debate all night whether or not competition is, is inherently good or bad, and some of you may have different opinions on that. Um, but can competition lead to things that are not cruciform? At the very least, even if, even if competition isn't inherently bad, can competition, or even ambition for that matter, can these things lead to things that are not Christian, that are not cruciform? Yeah, and we're gonna talk about some of those here as we go. So if you have your Bible, Matthew chapter 23, verse one. This is similar to a conversation that you see a lot in Matthew. In fact, you might even remember that we did a, uh, a sermon series quite a while back where I entitled it Redefining Greatness because Jesus' version of greatness is, again, much like what I think his definition of masculinity would be, upside down from the way the world tends to think. But he says this, verse 1, Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the scribes, what are scribes? People that can write, yeah? And what are they specifically writing? What's that? Co yeah, copying the law, right? They're copying the law. So they're, they're experts in the law because they spend all day, every day copying the law. So the scribes and the Pharisee, Pharisee means the separated ones, so they're a sect of Judaism. They sit on Moses' seat. These religious leaders, they sit on Moses' seat. So do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do. For they preach 
but they don't practice. They tie up heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. What, what's, what's the word we often, Jesus often uses for that? Hypocrites, Hypocrites right? They're, they're actors, right? They're acting. They're, they're putting on a show. They're pretending to be very religious, and they tell you what you ought to do, but they themselves aren't doing them. And so Jesus will launch into this long dialogue about the, the scribes and Pharisees, but I specifically want us to focus on the first part. He says, they do all their deeds to be what? Seen, Seen by others. For they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long, and they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. So would you say that these religious leaders were ambitious? Yes. Were they even competitive? Yes. And what, what were they ambitiously pursuing? Recognition. What else? Prestige. What's that? Okay, so it, it may, maybe sometimes, right? Maybe sometimes they were pursuing God, or maybe it started that way, and, and over time it became something perverted, and it became something that it wasn't, because, and the evidence that, that they weren't pursuing the real true God was that when the real true God showed up, they, they nailed him to a cross, right? And so their ambitious pursuit was, was maybe towards an idea of God, but wasn't towards Yahweh. And it was... What's that? Self-righteousness, right? Self-righteousness. Righteousness is, is this idea that I do what is just. I do what is good. Well, who is the one granting them that righteousness, that justification? Who's the one granting it to them? If it's self-righteous, right? It's I have declared myself righteous. I have declared myself to be doing a good job. And, and, and they, they were pursuing that, that idea of their own version of righteousness rather than the righteousness that, that God, the, the verdict that God gives. Okay, they, so they, they really like these things, right? They love the place of honor. They love the best seats. They love the greetings in the marketplace. They love being called rabbi by others. So what might be modern, American, maybe even masculine examples of this or, or the, the application of this? What would be similar for us? I mean, that may not be things you pursue, but we shouldn't pat ourselves on the back and say, well, I don't care anything about the best seats in the synagogue, right? I don't believe, I don't care anything about greetings in the marketplace or being called rabbi by others. What's that? Okay, we, we definitely can see this in politicians, can't we? Yeah, we can see this in people that are seeking uh, the, the place of honor and that kind of thing. But unless we have too many of those, we probably don't. What, what are some of the things that we, that we do? Social media. What? They want the place of honor. They want to be. They want their photo to be liked. Yes. They want to be friended by others. Yes. They want to go viral. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> there, there's that that instant that instant affirmation, and and even that feeling like I'm not enough. If I don't if I don't get enough likes, if I don't get enough shares, if if people don't appreciate what I'm saying or doing, I'm not enough. And in fact, I mean, so much of what we talked about in this class about masculinity is this desire for and this seeking being enough, being enough, and am I enough? And in every culture, there is some sort of a bar or a standard that says, when you hit this, you're enough. But what, what is it that feels like, whether it's true or not, what is it that always feels like happens with that bar? It does, doesn't it? It feels like it keeps moving, like the goal line keeps moving. Like they said, well, when you, when you get to this age, well, once you're 18, once you're 21, once you can do this, once you do that, once you have this, once you achieve this, and then so many of us spend year after year, decade after decade wondering, am I enough? And so we seek this sort of out, 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 external, outside of us validation that if if other people think I'm enough, if enough people tell me that I'm enough, if enough people tell me that I'm great, if I'm famous enough or rich enough or I get enough promotions or I get this or I get that, then I'll finally feel like I'm enough. Does it work? I mean, we, we can look all the way around us, can't we, at, at different celebrities and, and different people that have achieved things in their lives that we'll never achieve. 
And, and so many of them continue to be depressed and discouraged and, and down and, and, and self-hatred because they're seeking some sort of a validation. Their version of validation was if you sit in the best seats and you have these greetings and you're being called rabbi and, and they're pursuing the glory and the honor of people rather than the glory and the honor of God, right? This is not how you get the glory and honor of God. This is not how God says, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. And that's the big question of the ambition, isn't it? What is it that you want to hear and from whom do you want to hear it? Are you ambitious for other people to say, you're awesome, you're fantastic? And how many people does it take to say that to you? How many people does it take applauding you before you feel like you are enough? Or is your ambition for the applause of God, for God to say to you, you've been faithful, well done, good and faithful servant. Verse eight, but you are not to be called rabbi. He's talking now about his disciples. You are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher and you are all brothers. And call no man on earth, uh, no man your father on earth, for you have one father who's in heaven. Neither be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Christ. Now, my whole life I read that and I just made that about, frankly, the Catholic church or other religious groups, you know, calling a, a religious leader their father. But I didn't apply this to me. And my own selfish and carnal pursuits for the respect and honor of people. And that's really what Jesus is talking about. We can apply this to Catholicism. We can apply this to, to religious leaders, but we got to get the log out of our own eye, don't we? And say, in what ways do I do this? In what ways am I wanting people to respect me or to put me on a pedestal? And, and, and what does that look like in my life? But again, I mean, it's, it's, it's different in different environments, right? When I was in high school, there was one version of a pedestal and what it took to get on the pedestal was one thing. And then college age, it's something different. And then you look back at high school and you say, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I pursued that. I can't believe I was ambitious about all that. But now you just have a different ambition. And then when you're in your 20s and your 30s and your 40s and your 50s and your 60s and your 70s and your 80s, it, it just shifts what the ambition is. But a lot of us have a, an ambition and want to be on a, on a pedestal. Verse, uh, verse 11, the greatest among you, Jesus says, the greatest among you shall be your what? Servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. This is, this is the paradigm Jesus set up, and it's upside down from the world, right? The world says, I want to be great in order to be great. Of course you do. Of course you think that the position of greatness is on a pedestal. It's up high. It's up the ladder. We even talk that way, don't we? We talk about getting promoted, and we think about demoted as the other direction. We don't want to get demoted. We want to get promoted. We want to move up the ladder. We talk about having a career ladder. We talk about moving up the socioeconomic ladder. We talk about moving up in all of these areas of our life. And we think greatness is at the top. And Jesus comes along and says, no, no, no. Greatness is at the bottom. You want to be great? You become the servant of everybody else. Back to the washing the feet example. And especially back to the cross. You be humiliated and suffer and die for other people. This is the new, the new paradigm. So let me ask you, what does ambition look like in the Jesus paradigm? What does, what does ambition look like in a cruciform worldview? Is there ambition? Yes. Is there pursuing a goal, chasing after a goal? Yes. Is there a motivation? Yes. What is it? Servanthood, right? Servanthood. It's to, to move to the lower seat of the table, put someone else in the spotlight, wash somebody else's feet, lift somebody else up, even if that means you going down. And it doesn't mean that we're masochistic or, or we, it doesn't mean that we you know, want to, to hurt ourselves. It doesn't mean that, we, um, that we're looking for opportunities to be persecuted, but it does mean that we're looking for ways to, to serve other people. We're ambitious about that. And again, it is a pursuit, isn't it? And we should be ambitiously pursuing opportunities to not just serve, because sometimes we lie to ourselves, don't we? Because we live in a culture now where you can make yourself look great by serving other people, right? We even call it humble bragging. You've heard of that? Humble bragging? 
where we, we find ways to be like, yeah, you know, I've given up a lot of stuff and I've suffered a lot and we take pictures of ourselves doing something nice for somebody else. We even find a way to, to share in not so subtle ways good things that we did for other people. Is that what Jesus means? No, not at all. Whatever it is that, that seeks that place of, of promotion and spotlight and exaltation, that ought to be the opposite of our pursuit. Our pursuit is for the lower spot. But it, at every stage of my life, that has never come naturally to me. It doesn't come naturally to anyone. This is not the natural pursuit. The natural pursuit is the place of dominance. You, I don't think you find any animals, especially not predators, <laughs> that in their natural state, they seek the good of other people at their own expense. Animals are self-seeking, right? Even if that means killing or, or devouring or, or whatever it takes, even chickens have a pecking order. We talked about that last week. It is unnatural, I would say it's supernatural, to ambitiously pursue a humble position, a servant position. So I want to ask this question more than make a comment, um, because to me, in my mind, my Craig brain, when you talk about ambition, especially as a guy, because all my life, you know, in, 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 I wanted to have, like we talked about, that good career, mm -hmm. I wanted to have a good, comfortable home, and all those things, and I pursued them. And then I think about what we're talking about tonight, I wonder, is it the, the, the practicality to mm. say that, you know, it's not bad to have ambition in those areas, as long as it's not overshadowing spiritual ambition? Mm. Mm. What are your thoughts on that? It's a great question, and I'm going to open it up, but let me, let me just read the next verse and see if, it, see if it answers your question. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 through 12. Paul's talking about brotherly love. Um, he, he's talking about loving each other, and here's what he says in verse 11. He says, aspire, that's pretty similar to our word ambition, right? An aspiration, and again, when we think about aspirations, we usually think about things that are lofty, right? Lofty things that are high up. We're aspiring to something above us. We're something, aspiring to something up there. But he turns it upside down, says, aspire to live what? Quietly. Quietly. And to mind your own affairs, work with your hands, as we instructed you, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. Now, is it wrong to work a job, take care of your family? Nope. nope. In fact, that's a great aspiration. But does it fit within this paradigm to say, I want to have more than they do? Or my, the, the money in my bank account or the size of my house or the quality of my car, these things are indicators of my success or how well I'm doing. And, and I'm going to make a, and kind of to shift it away from the finances, that's one area, but we often talk about making a big impact in the world, don't we? Making a big splash in the world, doing something big, changing the world. When Paul's instructions to Christians were much more modest and humble than that. And again, even in the Christian world, how often do we feel guilty because we get to the end of our life and we think, how big of an impact did I make? How many lives did I change? Did I change the world? Like we always tell our, our high schoolers, guys, we put a big burden on your shoulders and you go, you graduate high school, we say, go out and change the world, right? Go out and do something huge. There's nothing wrong, I guess, with doing something huge, maybe. But that's not really the instructions that Christians are given in the New Testament. It's go out and, and do a bunch of little good things. Aspire to live a quiet life. Work hard. Take care of your family. Don't be dependent on anybody. Don't be mooching off of other people because that's not giving a good name to the church either. But, but it's not about going out and changing the world. Well, it is. It is. It is about going out and changing the world, but that's the thing. You don't go out and change the world by becoming a billionaire. You don't go out and change the world by getting your name in lights. You don't go out and change the world. You do in one sense, but not in the sense that Jesus taught his people to go out and change the world. If we're going to follow the example of Jesus and change the world like he did, he said it's more like a grain of mustard seed being planted in the ground. It's more like leaven being sown into a lump of dough. 
It's go and live a quiet, humble, kind, loving, self-sacrificing life. If, I mean, if you get promoted at work, great, leverage that for the kingdom of God. But that shouldn't be your aspiration. That shouldn't be your ambition. That shouldn't be your pursuit. That shouldn't be your goal. Does that make sense? It's one thing to get promoted. It's one thing to, to make money. There were rich people that came to Jesus. There were rich people in the church. There were successful people and even people who were well known. What becomes wrong is when that's our aspiration, when that's our ambition, when our ambition is to have our name in lights, when our ambition is for the spotlight, when our ambition is for the money, when our ambition is to get people to applaud us. And again, we're incredibly self-deceptive, aren't we? We can trick ourselves and say, well, but it's for the glory of God. I really want to do it, but it's for the glory of God. I, I can't tell you whether it is or not, but you have, to, you have to examine yourself and say, is this my aspiration? Is this my ambition? Does that kind of hit on the question you're asking, Craig? I think so. I mean, my interpretation is that our, our, we should aspire spiritually uh, above and beyond our, our, in our worldly sense so that when we're doing the things in our daily routines and mm -hmm. stuff like that, we want to do our best. We want to excel mm. at what we do. But our, our focus and our aspirations should be on the kingdom and yeah. doing Christ's work first yeah. and foremost. Yeah. And like you said, I think if you're doing the right things for the right reason and you're responsible and people will see that like they did for uh, Joseph, you're going to be pushed up because you can. I wouldn't say you're going to be, but I would say it's possible. Yeah. Right. Because that didn't always happen to Christians. But yeah, that's possible. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, he says work hard with your hands, right? I mean, that doesn't mean do halfway ridiculous work. Like, do good work. Whatever it is, do good work. Do well at whatever you do, but not for your glory. Not so that people honor you. Not so that you move up. Not so that you make more money than your neighbors. Not so that you can feel validated for being richer or more famous or a bigger star or a bigger whatever. They, this is why I asked the question, is it possible to operate and live within a competitive environment and have a far different ambition than competition? And I think it is. Eric? Yeah, I think about Nehemiah. Mm. Um, one of the biggest jobs in the whole empire. But what did he care about? When he heard that his people were in trouble, they were living without a wall in Jerusalem, he was devastated. Mm. And that actually called him to action to go and use what he had for, for God's people. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. And risk his life, right? I mean, it was amazing that it worked out the way that it did. It was only by the hand of God that it worked out the way that it did because it very well could have ended with, you know, no, you're the cupbearer to the king. You can't take off and go build a wall, you know, thousands of miles away. Well, and I think it's a, it's a good indicator, like, if we're going about our lives and our, our, our brothers and sisters are hurting. Absolutely. And, and there's people in need and it doesn't affect us. We're just thinking about what we need to do next. Yes. I think that's, that's the good indicator about where our ambition is. Absolutely. You guys are really good at segueing to the next verse because I think that's perfect. Paul, Philippians 2. We'll, <laughs> we're going to keep coming back to this one in several different classes. But he says, do how much? Nothing. nothing. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, count others equal to yourselves. Is that what it says? No, what does it say? More significant than yourselves. That, that could be translated something like count others to be your superior. And who are the others? Everyone else. What if they're literally our inferior? What if I'm smarter than them and I have a better job than them and I'm higher up the ladder than them? How should I think about them as if they are more important than you, more significant than you? Let each one of you look not only to his own interest. You, you, have, to, you have to take care of what we were just saying. You, you have to take care of your family. You have to work hard, do your job, but also to the interests of others. Let's go back to this first phrase. Do nothing from selfish ambition. What is selfish ambition? Again, we're not saying ambition is wrong. You need to be motivated. You need to have a goal. You need to pursue something. But what is selfish ambition? 
disregard for others. Yes, so selfish ambition could be how you think about or don't think about others. Sometimes that is competitive, and sometimes it's just apathetic about what's going on with other people. Like Eric said a minute ago, as Christians, when we find out somebody else is suffering, we need to have concern for them. If we don't care, I don't care. What difference does that make? I'm just, I'm just pursuing my quiet little life over here. Paul told me to pursue my quiet little life, and we're ignoring other people. That's a selfish ambition, even if it started out as something good. Willie? Yes, and that's the thing with heart issues, isn't it? That they work themselves out into our life, huh? That's right. That's exactly right. Yeah, what your heart is full of, that's what's going to come out. So it, selfish ambitions about what is in your heart. It's about the way you think about, the way you treat other people. Maybe it's about how you abide by or disregard the rules. If we're, if we're selfishly ambitious, we say, I don't care what the rules are. I don't care what's right or wrong. The end justifies the means. And for Christians, we can never have that mentality. We can never have the mentality that the end justifies the means. For us, the means are the end. The means are the end. It doesn't really matter how this job works out or how this, uh, this sports season works out or how this whatever works out. What matters is how you play the game, how you do the job. It matters the way that you conduct yourself in it but if you say all that matters is winning, all that matters is achieving, all that matters is getting the glory, all that matters is getting the money, all that matters is getting this, then you're going to step on other people, you're going to disregard the rules, you're going to lie, you're going to steal, you're going to cheat, you're going to manipulate, and it doesn't matter because you're selfishly ambitious. What else might that mean? So it might mean how you, how you pursue things, how you treat other people in the meantime. What else? Russ? Yes. But, I mean, it, it's so important when, when Jesus was a sacrificial lover to his bride, the church, and it didn't just mean the church. It meant us being sacrificial to our wives. Yes, our yeah, sisters, yes. To our brothers and sisters. Yes, yeah. And we're anything but that. Yeah. They were not doing that. That's right, yeah. And so sometimes, especially when you think about family, if you're selfishly ambitious, you say, I don't, I don't care. I don't care what's happening with my parents. I don't care what's happening with my siblings. I don't care what's happening to my spouse. I don't care what, you know, all that matters is achieving this. And sometimes we justify that by saying, it's just for a season. You see, you, you've heard that? It's just for a season. It's just a season where I'm kind of working really hard and kind of ignoring them. But that season sometimes turns into two seasons and three seasons and four seasons. And, and we, we sort of justify the fact that we're putting our family on the back burner because what really matters is getting a bigger paycheck, getting that promotion, moving into a bigger house, doing this, doing that, as opposed to what Russ said, Jesus laying down his life. So it could be the way that we treat others. It could be... Um, it could be the, the, the way that we're conducting ourselves. Somebody said how we think about ourselves. I don't know who said that, but how we think about ourselves. It also could be uh, the, the actual goal that we have. There are some goals that, that are neither good nor bad. They're just a goal. There are some goals that are good goals. It is good to pursue being like Jesus. That's a good goal. But there are some goals that are, that are inherently selfish goals that are just inherently selfish. Going back to the Pharisees, their goals that Jesus talked about, being called rabbi by others, um, getting the best seats in the synagogue, the greetings in the marketplace, these are selfish goals. And as Christians, we need to have a very different definition of what is right and what is wrong. Because what is right for us is not just not doing bad stuff, it's also being, as Russ said, sacrificial. It's being cruciform, because this is what he goes on to say. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself 
by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men. Paul's whole point is have this mind in yourself. Paul very rarely just talks theology just to talk theology. He's talking about the incarnation of Jesus, Jesus, the Son of God, becoming human because he's telling you do the same thing. In fact, this phrase, emptied himself. Jesus was not self-serving. He was not self-seeking. He emptied himself. He gave up all of the privileges of living at the right hand or living in, in, in glory with God. He gave up the privileges of equality with God. He continued to be God, but he wasn't omnipresent when he was living on the earth, was he? He was in one place at one time. He, he, there were things he didn't know. And, and there, were, there were things that he couldn't do. He got tired. He got hungry. God got hungry. And Paul says, you do the same thing. Empty yourself. Give up rights and privileges for the sake of other people. Look at verse, uh, look at verse 8. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, because he did this, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Now, did G was Jesus pursuing glory? Anybody want to say yes? I mean, he, he was, but, but not human glory, right? He wasn't pursuing, you're right, he wasn't pursuing human glory. Was he pursuing God's glory? Yes. He wanted God to glorify him. That's a good thing. I want God to reward you. I want you to be rewarded. I want you to be honored. I want you to be glorified. I want you to be exalted. But what is the path of exaltation? Humility. What is the path of glory? Self-sacrifice. Self-emptying. Willie? You know, I think, I recall exactly what the scripture was, but if a man is in a situation where he can't get Yes. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. His food is to do the will of the Father, right? He pursued doing the Father's will even above feeding his own stomach. Now, again, th that doesn't mean, you know, in, in that sense, being a martyr. It doesn't mean looking for or asking for persecution. It doesn't mean we have to starve ourselves. It doesn't mean that. But it does mean you have to put the glory of God and the good of others above your own interests. And selfish ambition is at odds with that. And that this is a different kind of ambition. In fact, in Galatians 5, when Paul's talking about the works of the flesh, he names things like enmity and strife and jealousy and fits of anger and rivalries. That word rivalries is the same Greek word as selfish ambition. Things like anger and strife fighting with each other. And those things go hand in hand with sometimes, like we talked about in the beginning, with unhealthy forms of competition and ambition. It's hard to really love some well, someone well when your ambition in life is to beat them, right? And we can go back to the politics thing for just a second. We get so polarized in our binary political world that says you're either this party or you're that party, and our whole mentality gets wrapped up in beating the other guys and we can't even love them well, we don't even see them as neighbors. We begin to de demonize them because our whole mentality is about beating them and how they're horrible and we can't have anything to do with them and they're the bad guys, we're the good guys. And that sort of rivalry, that sort of party spirit, that is at odds with walking by the spirit, right? And so, and so that, that goes hand in hand with everything we're talking about. James 3, he says, if you have bitter jealousy, and selfish ambition in your hearts. Don't boast and be false to the truth. This isn't the wisdom that comes down from above. It's earthly wisdom, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. See, again, back to what Willie said a minute ago, it's about what's in our heart. And when there's, and we can, we can justify it all day long. We talk about, well, it's, it's righteous indignation. It's righteous anger, right? 
But inside of us, there's bitterness and there's jealousy and there's selfish ambition and we want to beat and we want to win and we want to dominate and we want to be superior. And he says, when that exists in your heart, there will be disorder and every vile practice. It will, it will work itself out in our lives. And we will not love people well when that's in our heart. Romans 12, verse 9. Let love be genuine, abhor, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo, I wish we had more time, outdo one another in showing what? Honor. honor. Outdo one another in showing honor. Don't be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Should we be motivated? Should we be ambitious? Is there even really kind of a right way to outdo one another? (laughs) Kind of. And what's the way we outdo one another? Showing honor to other people. Lifting them up. Giving the credit to them. Putting them in the spotlight. Again, not in a self-deceptive way that says, oh, I'll go last, you go first. Everybody look at me, I'm going last, I'm letting him go first. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about genuine fading to the background. It's not about me, it's about them. And it's about the Lord. Serving other people, serving, other, serving the Lord and serving other people, lifting them up, exalting them, humbling ourselves, moving to a lower seat of the table. Jesus says, this is the actual path to greatness. This is the actual path to honor. So real quick, last slide. Christian men should be willing to sacrifice everything in their ambitious pursuit of a quiet life that is spent serving, honoring, and loving others. We should be willing to sacrifice everything to live a quiet life that is full of serving other people, honoring other people, loving other people, our family, parents, our siblings, our neighbors, our teachers, our co-workers, our boss. And this is our, this is our ambitious pursuit. Be ambitious, yes. Be motivated, yes. But not for the things that motivate carnal-minded people. Not for the things that used to motivate you. Not for the things that the flesh is motivated by. The flesh is motivated by applause. The flesh is motivated by pats on the back and lifting up on a pedestal. The flesh is motivated by money. The flesh is motivated by status. The flesh is motivated by the glory and the honor of people. But the spirit is motivated by the glory and honor of God. That you can know that if you pursue a cruciform life, a Christ-honoring life through sacrificing yourself for the good of others and the glory of God, then on the last day, you'll be raised up to live forever The meek will inherit the earth and the father will say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. And there is nothing, nothing the world offers you that can compare to that. Let's pray. Father, we long for that day, that day when we will see you face to face. And Father, until then, we pray that you help us to walk by the spirit and not by the flesh, to keep our eyes on Jesus and to lay down our lives for one another as you lay down your life for us. Father, thank you for sacrificing your son, Jesus, not only to liberate us from sin and death, but to show us how to truly love one another and how to be real men. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all.